So now we move on to the David Marston lecture. And I have the honor to introduce a well-known scientist here to the society. It's Dr. Ankin Tan, and he is the deputy director of the National Neuroscience Institute in Singapore and also associate professor at the Duke Gradwell Medical School in Singapore and also the PI of the Neurogenetics Lab and he has done a numerous, uh, numerous projects on really translational research in Parkinson's disease and looking at the molecular mechanisms underpinning disease-causing genes in Parkinsonism and essential tremor. And he also leads an enthusiastic group of young scientists working in this field. And he will present us today some new areas on the 3D human brain organoids towards a better disease model. Please, E.K. Tan. Thank you, Claudia, for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank the president, uh, Chris, um, and the members of the IEC, members of the voting panel, and uh, for this particular honor. I'm really, really humbled by this award. At the beginning, I'd like to also thank uh, my old boss, Joe Jankovic, who's not here today, uh, and also Tetsuo Ashizawa years ago I used to work in the VA hospitals uh, for the training in my formative years. And uh, for this particular lectureship, I have like eight typical faithful MBS member chosen to follow the instructions that have been given to me. As you're aware that this year's uh, team itself is on technological advances. So I've particularly chosen this topic itself on three-dimensional brain organoids uh, towards a battle disease model. So this is the, my conflict of interest. Um, as you know that uh, compared to many of the past recipients of the Marsden Award itself, uh, I've not worked with Dr. Marsden, neither have I been a student, but I'm very proud to say that I have been taught by him. In the uh, 1990s, I've attended the Comprehensive Movement Disorders course in the Aspen, Colorado. As you know, this is initiated by the pioneers in the field, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fan, Marsden, and uh, Joe Jankovic. And the course is so good that I actually I attended it twice uh, over separate years. And uh, during the course itself, this is where I have uh, my limited interaction with Dr. Marsden, primarily in the Q&A sessions and the small group discussion. And I can vividly remember that what he said in one of the discussion is that to take your dreams and lots of things have been discovered in the study of uh, uh, Parkinson's disease and related disorders. And there we are here, there we are here I, dedicated, I dedicate this particular lecture uh, to him. So this is outline my talk. I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the current disease model introduce uh, the concept of three, uh, uh, 3D uh, brain organoids, uh, highlighting some of the basic concepts in neurodevelopment and the breakthroughs in the technology in neurodifferentiation and that led to the birth of brain organoids and then highlight to you the disease modeling that has been used uh, using these brain organoids and some of the limitations and challenges and perhaps a peek into the future and this, uh, what many people thought is a science fiction journey. So for many of us who have been involved in clinical studies, clinical trials, you know that a lot of times whether you've identified a biomarker, identified a new mutation in the gene itself, ultimately the fundamental question that you'll be asking is what is the underlying physiology, pathophysiology. And to address this itself, a lot of times you need a model. The question here is, in the challenge, major challenge in studying brain disease is what is a good model? We all know traditionally that you have post-mortem tissues to work on. They are great, but they have limited availability. And this gives only a snapshot instead of developmental uh, 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 milestones. 
And you know, animal models, different animal models of Parkinson's disease have been created, the biochemical model, the transgenic model, but we know that they have limitations. Non-human primates itself, they're very difficult to scale up, even though you have a good opportunity to study some of the behavioral aspects. And many of the mouse models that we have tested, particularly for therapeutic testing, have not actually translated into actual results itself in clinical trials that we know that. And of course, for many scientists like, uh, uh, who work on 2D cell culture, the cell we know is easy to scale up the production, studying specific cell types itself. But these cultures itself do not primarily have cytoarchitecture that essentially do not primarily mimic uh, some of the uh, in vivo uh, 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 physiology that we're talking about. So it's in the context of this that I'm going to share with you the potential role of a three-dimensional brain organite in the dish. Can this solve some of these problems that we are talking about? So what is an organoid? In layman's term, an organoid is an artificially grown tissue that resembles an organ. And MIT, in its recent ranking in MIT Tech Review itself, highlighted organoid technology as one of the top 10 breakthroughs. And scientifically, currently in the consensus of a brain organite, the definition is that it's in vitro replica of a brain that recapitulates brain functions, contains multiple brain-specific cell types, and organizes itself to form brain-like structure. And we all know, brain is complex itself. It's not easily accessible. There's 87 billion neuronal subtypes. There are 1,170,000 1, kilometers of myelinated fibers. There are trillions of synapses. How do you solve it? How do you create this particular organ? To understand that, let me take to you some of the basic principles of neural development. Firstly, in vivo, studies have shown that for an embryo cell at stage to go into a stage of neural plate formation, it needs to be inducted through what we call neural induction through growth factors and signaling molecules like the bone morphog morphogenic protein, the wing pathway, and beyond that itself is a crucial step where it goes into what we call patterning, which is different different stations into the different brain region. It involves again many patterning and signaling molecules that goes both temporally with time and also is regionally specific. And it goes both dorsal caudal and guide dorsal ventral patterning. And so these are the concepts and the identification of the factors that allow in vivo us currently to apply this in vitro generation of neural uh, tube induction and also different shaping to some of the neural subtype. So this is just an example of a roadmap. If you look at specifically at the dopamine neurons itself, the 2D culture itself, that induction and differentiation process involve the wing and the so uh, Sonia Hedgehog protein, some of the uh, 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 key uh, signaling proteins that are uh, particularly involved. So now we'll take through, through to you the breakthroughs, uh, two major breakthroughs itself in two different categories that will lead us to set the stage for the development of the 3D organoids. Firstly, the breakthrough in pluripotent stem cell. So James Johnson, way back in 1998, was the first to identify or rather derive embryonic stem cell lines from human, human blastocysts. And you know that 207, this has been highlighted many times, Yamanaga and colleagues itself identified basically transcriptional four defined factors that now what we refer as Yamanaga factors itself in inducing pluripotent stem cell. And pluripotent stem cell refers to stem cells that can differentiate into different lineages and into different cell types. The other major group of progress is on breakthrough in technology in neural differentiation. Firstly, the human uh, uh, neural rosette formation. So Chan Su Chun, working then with James Thompson, was the first to identify, rather, identify and highlight that human embryonic stem cells could self-organize to form a neural rosette when they played the embryonic uh, bodies in the 2D culture. What it means is that if you look at this a picture, B picture, you can see that elongated cells congregating in center and then like a merry-go-round children holding hands together they form a rosette a ring-like structure and this is one of the major breakthroughs because these neural rosettes actually resemble embryonic neural tube which set the essentially the critical stage itself for the next stage of a brain region development 
But reading in between the lines in this particular publication, you will know that there are a lot of limitations. Firstly, this is only seen in less than 1% of the in vitro culture. And that's put a huge, huge limit in what we can do in scaling up of this process. Then the next stage itself was some seminal work there by the late uh, Yoshiki Sasai from uh, Riken in Japan. So what he did is that he takes this stage further by essentially standardizing the generation of uniform and bright bodies, as you can see here, in, by developing a 96 well plate itself and using seven free suspension, which reduces the number of variability in the generation and as in the culture medium, and then plating it in the dish and added four main patterning factors. And you look at the bottom line, particularly figure C, you will see that these and bright bodies self-organized to form apical basal polarized neural epithelium and this is very very important because this provides what we call the body axis in neurodevelopment in guiding the formation in one of the early stages the formation and patterning of the different brain region and there we have it itself a couple of years later Chambers and Kalik itself basically developed or rather found that a dual smack inhibition essentially that if you could inhibit the formation of the mesothelium and endothelium, you could increase the neural rosette, which I highlighted to you earlier, formation to the formation of neural tubes up to in vitro culture up to 70%, essentially allowing the ability to scale up the production of these structures itself. So now what does all this mean? This means that these breakthroughs in technology have now set a stage for everybody to go now further ahead to develop the first brain organoid. And not surprisingly, Dr. Sasai's group itself is the first. This is beautiful. If you look at the picture on the left side, you can see the embryonic eye, the optic disc. And if you look at the nature cover itself, you can see beautiful the green shade cover. It exact, almost exact replica of the optic disc. The difference is that if you look at it carefully itself, that the lens has a little gap there. There's no lens stuff because it's not from the neural epithelium. And you look at figure D, you can see those red markers. These are the, uh, the markers for the retinal pigmented uh, epithelial cells. And you can see that these, they have shown that this uh, retinal cell contains both rods and cones. This is a huge, huge step. And the next, next big jump itself is the birth of the first whole brain organoid by Gergen Noblich and his uh, superstar postdoc, uh, Madeline. Um, and what they have shown, this is a fairly amazing picture when it first released itself. Let me just take you through, all right? You look at the left side of the picture itself, you can see the green color. Um, uh, 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 layer. This is the neuron layer, and then you have see the pink color, which is a, a neuroprogenitor cells and a cavity. And if you look at this carefully, compared to a section of a fetal brain at 10 weeks, you can see striking resemblance of the formation of what looks like a, a cortical uh, organoid. And what they did was that, unlike some of the previous investigators, they, lead, they let the cultures grow longer without adding any patterning or growth factors or small molecular inhibitors. Whether it's by chance they have discovered this or they have done it uh, through various experiments, we do not know. But what they have shown is that if you leave them alone, the organoid self-organized to form regions resembling the whole developing brain which I've highlighted to you earlier. And since that discovery itself, our group was the first, basically, to develop the mid-brain organoid. So what, let me tell you the story behind this. So when I first look at the Lancaster's picture itself, as a very biased movement disorder a neurologist, the first thing, well, I was amazed by the picture, the first thing I was looking for was the mid-brain. And I was very disappointed because I couldn't find it in, the, in that particular figure. All right, it was missing. So I called my good friend, Huck, who actually works in the cancer cell, stem cell line, a, a biology, I say that, Huck, I think, uh, can you partner me in this itself? I'm very interested to gener generate the midbrain. And the first thing he told me was, what is, asked me was, what is the midbrain? So I'm going to take you through now, all right? As you know that uh, in Parkinson's disease, or rather in the midbrain itself, the past compactor, substantial past, the nigger past compactor contains A9 dopamine neuron, they project the striatum, they produce neuron uh, melanin, and they degenerate in, in diseases like PD. And the past reticulata contains primary of the GABA neurons and the tegmental area, primary the A10 uh, neuron. So what we did over a two-year period, this is again a very simplistic 
representation is that we look at basically the patterning factors, as I mentioned earlier, both region-specific and in a temporal relation to one another to identify the potential pattern factors and the signaling molecules that could intersect, as shown here itself, that could generate the midbrain at that point in time. So we did basically use the size method to generate the 96 well plane, or rather uh, to generate the embryoid bodies, and we have also used the bioreactors. To cut the story short itself, we have basically devised a combination of neuropathic factors that direct the differentiation of the organoids to the ventral midbrain, for specifically looking at the caudalization, ventralization, and the differentiation of dopamine neurons. And this is the sequential growth of the organoids. You can see here from the size of 500 microliter day two, it grows up to day seven. And from day seven, there's an exponential growth all the way to two to three millimeter, depending on the time span. And when we section the immunohistochemistry, uh, to look at the immunohistochemistry staining, you can see on the, this particular day 14 picture, you see the green, stain, uh, green staining for the uh, FOX A2, which is indication of four plate per progenital. It shows striking resemblance to the mouse ventral midbrain. And in day 45, it is TH neurons derived from the ventral midbrains. Uh, 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 the numbers increases, and day 60 itself, this TH neuron expresses A9 marker, GERP2. And then uh, some of these stain for calvinine, which is essentially uh, by when expressed by the A10 the dopamine neurons. And uh, these neurons itself have shown some characteristics of functional ability, particularly in generation of action potential. And they are essentially modulated by the, uh, uh, by the receptor uh, dopamine agonists. And then we have quantified this dopamine level itself uh, in, uh, in tandem with the growth of the organoids. And then when we look at the transcription analysis of the different brain tissues, looking at the adult, different adult uh, region of midbrain, and then do comprehensive uh, analysis at the transcriptal level to compare with the other 2D and 3D and also the human prenatal midbrain, we see a significant overlap of our midbrain organoid with the prenatal midbrain, but not with the, uh, the rest of the region. So what? Next, we went to do a single cell uh, analysis. Each of these columns indicate a single cell, and you can see that this gene expression signature of our, in our organoids uh, simulates, uh, or rather represents, what, what we typically see in the A9 dopamine neurons. And of course, we see as it, the organoid age, the GABA uh, uh, markers, and some of the glial cells. And the very interesting thing here is I was very interested to look at what happens if this organoid ages itself. All right, and then lo and behold, after long-term culture, these organoids, on, you can see on the right side here, it contains pigments, all right? Pigments, at that point in time, we're not quite sure, but subsequently a eureka moment came that we think that these are neomelanin that we can't see in the substantial nigra. So how to prove that it is? So we essentially showed that these granule stains uh, stain up on the Fontana Mason uh, scans, as you can see here. And the bottom row, you can see the representation of in the post-mortem striking resemblance. And in the uh, electron microscopy, on the upper, uh, uh, upper row, you can see that in day 122, very, very nice granule that really resembles what we see uh, for granules isolated from the human adult substantial nigra. Next, we all know that neuromelanin is formed by oxidative uh, uh, polymerization of dopamine, and we have added, treated these organoids with dopamine and also with L-dopa, and we see an increased formation of this uh, neuromelanin. And then we then, in parallel, generated the human uh, brain organoids in parallel with the mouse brain organoids, and we show that in mouse uh, brain organoids, there is a total loss of dopamine. I'd like to play a very short video, particularly for this presentation, you can see the evo evolution of at the culture day two, day four, and how these uh, cells grew. Of course, these are not to scale, but you can see exponential growth of a week one onwards itself. Uh, how we have maintained them in vitro and then how new melanin itself appears uh, usually in the third or fourth month of the cultures you can see that and of course in the just pure microscopy you can see the scattered uh, new melanin 
So the, the fundamental question some people ask will be what's the difference between 2D and 3D and what are the advantages? So I just want to highlight in the interest of time that the brain organoids is generated by Lancaster's group itself showed really a presence of an outer subventricular zone region that is actually totally absent in the mouse. All right, this provides a great opportunity all right, to simulate uh, much of the, the disease modeling that we talk about. So as a clinician, a lot of questions have been asked to say that, you know, spend time playing with this, but you know, what's the clinical relevance? So now we talk very briefly on disease modeling, and uh, there are many diseases that we use using the brain organoids. In the interest of time, I'll just highlight a couple. Parkinson's disease. At this moment in time, there are no published literature on uh, the disease modeling in Parkinson's disease, but in the coming months, several reports will come out, and I'll just show you some of our, um, uh, uh, our data that is currently uh, under review. So essentially, we have captured many of the cellular hallmarks in our brain organoids that harbor uh, the Parkinson's disease causing genes that we have generated several of these. I will just highlight some of the, some of the more pertinent results. Our organoids which carry uh, different Parkinson's related mutations itself have reduced dopamine uh, production and, uh, and the number of uh, accounts over long-term culture. And what is striking is that we are able to show different forms of alpha synuclein aggregates in these the dopamine-positive neurons itself. And more interestingly is that we have shown Lewy body-like structure. As you can see that these are uh, 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 cytoplasmic, uh, 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 intracytoplasmic inclusion, insulin inclusion for the HNE stains, and you can see the nice ubiquitin and the alpha synuclein, very nice halo around it itself with a very nice central core on the, uh, transmission, uh, on, on the electron microscopy. And very interestingly itself, by manipulating the microenvironment and the external insult itself, the Louis formation actually changes. So it's essentially itself that the system itself provides a tractable kind of uh, a platform itself for us, all right, to better understanding, uh, understand uh, uh, the underlying uh, mechanism of disease causing genes. And you can see that those neurons that carry uh, these uh, uh, mutations actually have disrupted the functional connectivity. Alzheimer's disease itself is basically much more uh, obvious at this moment in time because you know that in 2D cultures, the plaques and neurofibrin tangles are rarely observed. But in 3D brain organoids, they show excellent, really nice amyloid accumulation, hyperphosphorylated tau and neurofibrin tangle. Again, showing that the organoid itself may be a very suitable uh, model over 2D culture in uh, modeling some of uh, the uh, mechanistic, providing some mechanistic insight into the disease. And lastly itself, uh, the Zika virus, we all know that Zika virus is associated with microencephaly and this provides a great opportunity because when we generate the organoids that are infected by Zika virus, it actually cross, causes microencephaly because it actually infects predominant neuroprogenital cells. And uh, various groups have looked at this and, uh, you know, and over a very short time period itself, using the organoid model, Identify a specific pathway, for example, the identification of the like tree uh, receptor pathway itself have been used to screen for targets and to show that this works. So again, this provides proof of concept that disease modeling to drug screening is extremely important in the understanding uh, of uh, the uh, Zika virus associated encephalopathy. Last couple of slides on limitations. So much of this promises, uh, what are limitations? Well, there are numerous limitations. One of these is that the organoid contains, it's very heterogeneous. It contains many sub-cell types. However, it lacks, at least for brain organoids, it lacks vascularization, it lacks uh, non-neural structures, and it is immature. So this is a comparison of an organoid with the actual human fetal ventral midbrain cellular composition to single cell uh, RNA sequencing, and you can see that many, many genes that we find that we can find in the human uh, ventral midbrain itself are not found in the current model of uh, version of the midbrain organoid. And the absence of non neural structures is a big problem because it will limit the growth of these organoids over time. And the immaturity uh, question is always big in play because we know the brain organoids resemble early stage fetal brain, but how do we study the aging and how do we apply it all right, in the understanding of degenerative condition? So this is again a very, very big question. Making the next generation organoid is a lecture by itself. Very briefly, we all know that we can reduce the heterogeneity to creating chambers that could perhaps 
changes a modified morphogen concentration in a microfluidic device that could basically mimic some of the spatial temporal chemical environment and then perhaps generate a much more physiological neural tube uh, in its development that would perhaps um, uh, generate a much more authentic 3D structure. The vascularization, you can implant these human organoids to maybe a living structure or living uh, animals or even living tissues to perhaps uh, gather its uh, vas uh, vessels and to sustain it long-term growth. The creation of the micro uh, fluidic device itself could increase perhaps the potential vascularization in terms of by enabling these organoids to be bathed by nutrients on a, a continuous basis itself and promoting its growth. And there are others where we could actually fuse the different brain regions along its physiological body axis such that, which this has already been done, such that the natural tendency and the connectivity of the excited tree, for example, uh, uh, neurons like in the dorsal region could actually physiologically connect with the inhibitory gabapentinergic uh, neurons. And this again has been uh, published in the recent Nature publications. And ultimately itself, when we look at brain organoids in the applications of clinical medicine, we'll be looking at what's the role of uh, organoid in precision medicine. This is fairly similar principle to, do, uh, to, to those who are working on 2D culture. And last, my last two slides is you know, a question that has always been asked and that increasingly being asked is that what if the brain organoid will someday has a mind of zone? Is it possible? Well, we think that perhaps at this moment in time it's too early to say, but just a couple of months ago, a nature commentary and a, re and a review looking at the potential, uh, looking at we should start thinking of some of these issues of the moral status, you know, the human uh, animal chimeras, and also what happens if one day we think that the, the organoid with enough cells, enough connectivity, whether they could be conscious and whether they can even feel pain, all right? So I think that these are some of the issues that we that we'll be thinking about. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope in a very short time frame, I have given you a very bird's eye view of the 20, 30 year of work, all right, uh, and of the literature itself on the three-dimensional brain organoid development. Uh, we have showed, I hope I've showed to you that organoid technology, current organoid technology allows generation of different 3D brain regions, and in particularly in the cortical regions, these neurons would differentiate and reorganize themselves in a special orientation that is similar, markedly similar to the human brain. And the midbrain organoids contain dopamine neurons with some of the supporting features itself of a midbrain structure, and that they may be useful in uh, uh, modeling uh, diseases, in particular neurodevelopmental, and hopefully in the future, uh, work more work to show that it will it will help us in uh, uh, modeling neurodegenerative diseases. But organoid technology has limitations and is still evolving. And at this moment in time, it's complementary to many other disease models, but it cannot cannot completely replace in vitro and vivo models. I'd like to thank uh, my partner Hark right at the center. Uh, for his uh, support, and then Sean Jay for Neurophysiology Studies, our postdoc Joe, and my student Maggie, who's in the audience itself. Last, I'd like to give a big, I'd like to really thank everybody for coming for this uh, uh, MDS Congress in Hong Kong, and the entire Movement Disorder AOS uh, leadership, both past and present, to generating support and uh, encouraging everybody to attend this particular Congress uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong. Thank you very much for attention.